Hello and welcome to episode one of this new podcast, The Political Ring. A lot of times people think of politics as a line, a spectrum, with the left and the right. That's probably the wrong way around from your point of view, but it was right for mine. But I don't see it like that. We have a lot of issues where we actually meet a lot in the middle. I see more politics like a circle where we go around and our placement in that circle determines our political views. So in that kind of environment, we have more a political ring. So I'm Zoe Kirk Robinson. Welcome to the political ring. The purpose of this podcast is partly so I can talk to you and then you can talk to me and we'll have a discussion about the latest issues in world affairs, the news, politics, everything like that. And partly that we can have a conversation with experts and leading figures within certain political environments. It'll be part and part. So today I want to discuss the current issues in the NHS with trans people, Trump's trial and the politics around HS2, that uh, high-speed rail link between Manchester and London. And I do have my first guest for that segment. So we'll be talking to railway expert Jennifer Kirk, who is also a YouTuber, and she'll be coming on for the show later on. But for now, let's talk about the politics around the NHS and trans people. Imagine my shock, ladies and gentlemen, when I woke up this morning to find that the latest headline on the front page of the newspaper was Transgender Women to be Banned from Female Wards. No mention of trans men. Always look out for that, because if there's no mention of trans men, but only focus on trans women, this means that this has been a campaign by what they call a tra- gender critical people. That's what they like to call themselves these days because trans exclusionary radical feminist or TERF, they decided was a bad name. This is something that happens in a lot of schemes, such as multi-level marketing or a pyramid scheme. Whenever people catch on to the label that's being used to denigrate it and to show that's a problem, they change the name. They don't change the scheme, they just change the name. And that's what happened here. So let's have a look at what's actually happened. Health Secretary Stephen Barclay will today announce proposals to push back against wokery in the health service. Now, some of the things that he brings up are actually quite interesting because uh, it does show how the wedge issue is uh, put forward. Go in with a small end of a wedge, like we think X, Y and Z has been pushed a little too far. People accept that, so you're in, you've got your edge. And then you push further and further with the wedge. So what were the wedge issues on this that actually got these people to get a seat at the table? Well, let's have a look. Mr Barclay has become frustrated by ideological dogma in the health service, which has led to terms such as breastfeeding being replaced by chest feeding and guidance referring to pregnant people rather than pregnant women. Now, most trans people would have no problems with those terms being reversed because it sounds silly. It sounds silly to trans people. It sounds silly to cis people. And that's what we call a wedge issue. That's how you get your feet under the table if you want to try and ban trans people from somewhere. Those issues, I don't think most people would have a problem with, but that got them in. And then they got to do this bit. Changes would give men and women the right to be cared for on single-sex wards, only shared by people of their own biological sex. Biological sex is the term used by anti-trans campaigners because they think that, uh, oh, we're changing our biological sex, so they're not really X, Y, and Z, so that, that man's not really a man, that woman's not really a woman. It's not actually as clear-cut as that. There are many pieces of scientific research that demonstrate that sex and gender are not as simple as anyone claims. And this is widely accepted in the scientific community. There are so many issues surrounding sex and gender that uh, claiming that it's one or the other in a binary is just completely anti-science. But they always use it, so look out for the term biological sex, because it's usually an indicator that science hasn't actually been followed. But let's put that aside for the moment and look at what is actually being suggested here. So, single sex wards. To be honest with you, I don't think many people would have an issue with single sex wards, because the idea of being in hospital, being in a fairly vulnerable state, especially if you just come out of surgery or anything like that, or you've broken a bone, you can't uh, go anywhere, Having only people around of the same sex as you seems perfectly fine. I've been on single-sex wards. You've probably been on single-sex wards. Never had a problem. I do have an issue with mixed-sex wards at times. 
Uh, there was one time I was in, in a very vulnerable state in, in hospital and I ended up sharing an area with a man I didn't know and I felt very, very unnerved. I didn't know who he was, I didn't know what he was there for and I didn't trust that I was safe. So I understand. I do understand the idea of this need for a same-sex ward. I get it. But here's the thing, trans men are men, trans women are women, and trans people just want to be treated the same as anyone else. They're in hospital for a reason, they're not looking for a date. This is the, the thing that uh, these gender activists never seem to understand. We just want equal treatment at hospital. We're not there looking to score. Under the proposed changes, trans patients would be housed in separate accommodation, which could mean their own rooms. Here's the thing. How many times have you seen a ward that was empty in the NHS? How many times have you seen a room that was empty in the NHS? Not often. So, if trans people have to be uh, housed in a separate ward or a separate room, that means a ward that cisgender people can't use. That cuts down the amount of beds that are available in the NHS. We all know the problem with available beds in the NHS. You want to do the same thing with a room, a separate room that uh, is only for trans people or is only used for trans people when a trans person is there, that's a separate bed. That's a bed that can't be used for anyone else. We already have a bed shortage in the NHS. We already have a staff shortage in the NHS. This is only going to hurt every single person who needs to use the NHS because you are reserving rooms for a minority that might not be there. This is the problem that we have with language like this. This is why it doesn't work. This is a fairly unworkable idea. And that's not even the end of it. Let's have a look at this bit. Earlier this year, a report by the Policy Exchange think tank said NHS trusts were compromising women's rights by providing same-sex intimate care based not on a staff member's biological sex, but on their self-declared gender identity. If you have a problem and you need someone to look at you and you go to your GP and your GP is a man and you're a woman, you can request a woman doctor or you can request a chaperone for that doctor so that you are sure nothing bad is going to happen. You have that choice already. This actually doesn't change much. You already have what they're saying here. A right to same-sex intimate care based not on staff members' biological sex, but their self-declared gender identity. So that's not actually a change. That is just rewording what we already have. So what's the point? We see this a lot in politics. We need a headline. We need to look like we're doing something. So we're going to make this new law, and it does X, Y, and Z. And then people who actually know the law go, but we already have X, Y, and Z. Why can't you just enforce what we've already got instead of bringing in a new thing? There's a reason. It's because it's not about the law. It's about the politics. We need to look like we're doing something. There we go. So that grabs the attention. At the moment, the Twitter sphere and all of the opinion blogs, if you go to any left or right wing news news site, <laughs> which is usually just a community uh, action group pretending to be a news source, um, and also some of the papers, of course, they're all going on about this, like, this is some attack on uh, trans people by the Conservatives. And yes, it is an attack on trans people by the Conservatives. Or, oh, Labour wouldn't have done this. I've seen that a lot while I've been researching this, because I do my research before we start. But here's the thing. Earlier this year, Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, said his party would back single-sex wards based on biological sex. Labour will not challenge this. Labour follow this as well. This is the problem we have. So you have people saying, oh, this is a, a Conservative Party attack. Labour back it. Who do you go for if you don't want to back this? That's the problem we have in the UK at the moment. The anti-trans agenda has hit all sides of the political spectrum. The whole political circle that we've got, the political ring, is attacking trans people at the moment because it's easy headlines. It's easy scores for the politics people. It's an easy way of getting people that are very, very loud to join on your campaign. And that's all this is. Trans people are currently being a scapegoat. That's all that matters for point scoring in politics. This is the problem we have with politics right now. It's ridiculous. Trans people are being used as the whipping boys, essentially, for just getting away with whatever you want and getting people on side so that they don't start shouting at you for your other policies. 
Can we actually have a return to decency and normality in politics, please, where we do things because they're right, not because they're very vocal, anti-whatever people are screaming the loudest? It would be nice if we could do that, because then we could move forward as a people, all together. HS2, the big high-speed rail line that was going to be the centre part of the northern powerhouse from back when David Cameron was Prime Minister. I know that seems quite a long time ago now, but it was going to go from London to Manchester and make it quicker and easier for people in the north to access the capital. The big thing that was going to bring a load more people into the north from London and be the commuter route that would bring the whole of Britain together might now be scrapped. Now, before this was announced uh, today, because this is yet another thing that just popped out of nowhere from uh, the Conservative Party conference, I spoke to Jennifer Kirk about the benefits of HS2 and why it was so controversial. Let's have a look at that. So in our first episode, we have our first guest, and uh, we're here to talk to Jennifer Kirk about HS2 and perhaps some other ideas for infrastructure of a national interest. Jenny, what is HS2? It's a new railway and pretty much the first high-speed rail line that's been built in the UK since the Channel Tunnel rail link, which in turn the rest of the network is pretty much Victorian infrastructure. So you can imagine that it's um, pretty oldy-worldy. It does do its job, but creaking a little bit at the seams and I think it's easy to forget that since the 1990s uh, rail traffic has increased dramatically on the network both passenger numbers and uh, a lot of the freight that's being carried as well and uh, you know gone are the days of the decline and we're now at a point where the network that exists is at breaking point there just aren't enough paths for trains and high speed 2 is a continuation of the high-speed route that's being built from London to Birmingham and this will take it up to Manchester and there's originally a plan for there also to be a spur over to Leeds and this would give a high-speed rail route for passengers uh, between London and these locations but also you know if you want to go from Manchester to Birmingham it's a much speeded up trip so it's competing with air travel so rather than jumping on an aeroplane it's making it practical for business people to jump on a train which is also great for our environmental commitments and by moving trains from the existing Victorian network onto this HS2 um, and actually uh, getting people to, to use that it frees up capacity on the existing rail routes whereby we can have more commuter trains, more stopping trains that stop at every station and also more paths for rail freight as well. So it's also about increasing the capacity of the network as a whole. That is actually quite interesting because I'm very much interested in the idea of taking uh, traffic off the roads and putting it back on the rail so you know, instead of having all of these out of town uh, industrial estates you could also have uh, industrial estates near a railway where you could have terminals uh, that just shift to warehouses that can then be used as hub and spoke for distribution yeah and we're actually seeing a lot of those start to turn up to turn up so for example the daventry international rail freight terminal or derft for short um is at a location that's pretty close to where the m1 and the m6 uh split from each other it's a, a rail freight terminal that allows for onward distribution for products there's actually a lot of huge distribution centres there as well and the idea is that these get rail connected. There's another one if you go further north up the M1 where you reach the A50 at Kegworth there's a brand new rail freight distribution terminal there alongside East Midlands Airport and that's entirely new there never existed any facilities there before and it's recently been opened and these do allow for um, uh, goods to say be imported through the Channel Tunnel or even from Felixstowe and then onward moved with via trains to then have the final distribution either via lorry or in some of the cases of these distribution centres directly to the end customer who, who is will be rail connected and there are 
terminals like these uh, up and down the country and they don't grab the headlines um, as much as say you know new motorways getting built do but behind the scenes there is a lot going on with the railways but capacity is a huge issue we, we saw the um, a huge amount of capacity of Britain's rail networks removed from the the 1960s but also in the 1970s the 1980s and it's people blame um, the beaching report and say you know this is the moment that Britain's railways were decimated but actually a huge route mileage was subsequently closed in the 1970s and 1980s um, quite possibly a much more severe uh, closure of routes as well as rationalisation in the run-up to privatisation in 1997 um, there was a huge amount of capacity ripped out of the rail network on this this strange idea that by making it cheaper to run it would be uh, a uh, a better saleable asset to new buyers and actually the damage between 92 and 97 was immense where we saw routes getting singled we saw a lot of um, freight only routes um, starting to fall by the wayside so um, for example the Manchester Fallowfield loop line disappeared in this time and it's now had huge chunks of it built over but you know it's, mm. it's this used to be the great central railway main line to Manchester Central and we lost that uh, route as being a viable rail route you know as late as the early 1990s which I, I think is um, unforgivable you know we saw I agree certainly in Manchester stations like Manchester Victoria um, in the early 1990s a lot of that real estate was sold off for development with no thought about the impact on the railway so Manchester mm. Victoria went from being a 14 platform station with a lot of capacity to being a very constrained six platform shadow of itself and we're seeing that now as a bottleneck in the network but because they sold the land off and it's got um a big um, it's got the arena on top yeah. of it yeah but a lot of that is also built on the footprint of what used to be half of Manchester Victoria. That does uh, uh, explain a lot. When I moved to Manchester from Durham, I had to uh, wonder to myself, because I'm going to and from work via Manchester Victoria and looking at this huge building, it's really ornate for what appeared to be a local line. Yes. It didn't make sense. Well, um, Manchester Victoria used to have 14 platforms. There was a lot of bay platforms there, but there was also a lot of through platforms mm. and also what they call avoiding lines. And um, because a lot of the platforms were removed, um, all but two of the bay platforms were removed, um, but all of the avoiding lines were removed. What it means is in peak hours, it's just choked up with trains. Yeah. And there aren't actually any paths for freight trains to go through um, whereas before they would have trundled through um, separate lines down the middle of the station that that, that isn't possible and not now. getting in the way and that's part of what hs2 was supposed to help with isn't it um, if you took the part. the express trains off those lines and put it onto hs2 then the passengers are going back and forth without being stopped by the freight well, it's extra capacity and mm. people might say, well, why don't you upgrade the existing routes that exist? I believe you can't in certain areas. There's just not space anymore. But it's not just that. It's um, There is an element of cost as well yeah. and the disruption. Um, to actually rebuild an existing rail route, you've got to do that around services that are running. I, you know, It's just not an option to just close huge chunks of the network for what would amount to years yeah because you, you can't put the train it can't just drive round yeah. it has to go on the rail and if the rail's not there it can't go absolutely and you know the whole point is to encourage people to use the railways and so how does selling to to people oh for the next two years you've got to find an alternative route how, how is that encouraging them to yes. use the rail route so it's always cheaper theoretically to um, 
build a new route or even to take a route that's 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 being closed if it's practical to and actually rebuild that because you're not then um interrupting the current operation of the railways and that you know there's things there's lots of plans that have floated around over the years like the uh rebuilding of the great central railway um which um arguably should never have shut it was built to the burn loading gauge which is a much bigger loading gauge that's used is that um, the in, one that's for that's used on europe in europe yeah. yeah um and this is the thing about britain's railways we were the first and by being the first people learn from that and make improvements <laughs> but you're left with an infrastructure that can be quite restricted yeah so what you saw was that um, the loading gauge, which is kind of the, uh, if you imagine a tunnel, it's the size of the tunnel you need to fit the train through. That loading gauge is much bigger on Europe. Yeah. Um, and it's why, for example, the Channel Tunnel Rail Link had to be built um, as much as anything, because otherwise the um, the TGVs couldn't operate into to London, and it, it just made sense because it then meant that trains could run from London and just keep going to Brussels, to Paris, and onwards theoretically. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of ISO standard shipping containers, um, these days. Most freight that's not bulk freight, things like um, aggregates or coal or oil, they go in shipping containers. Which, which are is, a set size. Yeah, and they have a, an international standard organisation um, definition. And uh, unfortunately, this is very, very difficult to fit some of these containers within the, um, the UK loading gauge just because of that legacy of we were the first, we built them, and there was no um parameters of like well how big do you make it people just built what they thought was okay i thought they were based on uh the load and gauge of a, an old wagon well uh, yeah i mean there was a um an element of uh, everything is derived from what comes before so if you yes. go far enough back it's it's the width of a horse's bottom from the roman era from the roman yes. era <laughs> so if you measure the ruts in roman roads they're about the same width as uh, the rails are apart and you you had to pick a distance and that's what they went with and we, you know we had the gauge wars you know it wasn't clear and cut people didn't go oh well we'll have four foot eight and a half inches um actually there were other gauges and a lot of these fell by the by and then you had the gauge wars um where different companies competed to be the dominant rail routes you had things like this seven feet and a quarter inch of the great western railway but also a number of different railway companies and, and actually you could argue that um we've been hamstrung ever since by the fact that the uh, the broad gauge lost the gauge wars because mm. that would have given a huge amount of um uh, loading gauge envelope for for stuff you know if we if our entire rail network was built to seven foot gauge um we probably wouldn't be talking about issues with being able to fit shipping containers through we would have double deck trains which are just impractical in the uk but, uh, but you course, see a lot overseas which yeah. massively increases the uh, utilisation of a train. You can get so yeah. many more people in, but you don't need to extend the infrastructure. Yes, because it just goes up instead of built vertically. Uh, the other thing that I have to ask is, why is HS2 so unpopular? There's an element, of, I, I guess, of nimbyism, not in my backyard. Whenever you build any infrastructure project, and mm. bear in mind, I mean, the the this is a strip of land uh, going from London to Birmingham and onwards up to Manchester. That's a lot of real estate. That's a yeah. lot of people's houses. That's a lot of disruption. And people don't like that. And it doesn't really matter whether, you know, we've seen this with road building. We've seen this with um, new runways for Manchester Airport. I remember all the protests with Swampy and a tunnel. Uh, the new um, air runway at Heathrow. Which all it needs. Of, yeah. And that's the problem is, you know, 
modern living needs modern infrastructure. Yes. So the problem with HS2 is it's a very dominating strip of land up the country and people don't like that disruption. And then you get a lot of people who use it as a bandwagon to like, well, just prote what are we protesting about? What do you got? Um, but also it's become this bottomless pit for money. And unfortunately you see this with pretty much any government project, yeah. be it a computer system, a hospital, um, building a new aircraft carrier. It's like it just, nobody can get a handle on on costs. It, and it's, it's, it's just ridiculous how you'll end up, there would be an original projection, it will cost this much, and then it goes up and up and up. And you see literally hundreds of millions of pounds disappearing to with consultants and yeah. uh, and and i'll be honest this is the bane of every government project and it's not just in the uk you it's see this now yeah this is the problem when that when um people get on the gravy train and it, it can often be seen as being a bit of a gravy train because it's like let's just hose money around and there is an element of that so we've seen HS1 and HS2 go massively over budget, not just in terms of time to build, but you're talking billions, like staggering amounts of money. Um, and you know, you, if you try and, and visualise a billion pounds, it's just most people can't get their head around how much money that is. You know, it, it is a staggering amount. Yeah, you know, it, it's like, uh, I think um, I read somewhere that a billion pounds, if you spent a pound every second it would still take you 34 years to spend a billion pounds uh, that's that's like what sort of of levels we talk this is a lot of money i could probably do it <laughs> yeah it's a challenge accepted <laughs> this is like <laughs> baldrick how did you find a turnip that cost a thousand pounds it wasn't easy had to haggle <laughs> Um, but no, it's like you're talking about a lot of money and then you get the usual things like, oh, why don't we spend this on schools or hospitals or, you know, like insert pet project here. And that, um, you know, people see money that they want for their pet projects going on something that isn't their pet project. Yes. So you get an element of that. And, you know, this is politics for you. Unfortunately, yes. Um, it, it, and I'm, I'm very much in the favour of... If, if national infrastructure and things that are in the national interest should not be political. Yeah. It should be, we need this. This is how we're going to do it. And if uh, it's the majority have agreed to it, right, that's it. End of story. We're doing it. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen this before where people have tried to reopen railway lines. And it does mm. seem that railway lines are a bit of the butt monkey because where um, roads or air airport runways are concerned, it gets pushed through, generally speaking. You know, you, you get like the Newbury bypass, you end up with swampies in a tunnel for six months, but then it gets built. But, for example, there's um, Pesnet, I think it's pronounced Pesnet, in Birmingham. There used to be a railway line up to a distribution park. And latterly, um, up until the very early 1990s, I think it was Perrier, the fizzy water from yeah. France had a distribution centre there. And these trains would come in and get unloaded there. And then that closed and everything simmered down. The run-up to privatisation, we lost so much infrastructure because it was deemed like, oh, this is unethical economical for our mates to buy sort of thing so stuff was just left to close down and they did what they called exit pricing where they made it oh, uneconomical yeah. for companies to use a service as an excuse to close it so anyway this rail line never got pulled up it still exists it's there in the bushes and I believe a freight... Because you need a, an act of parliament to close a railway line, don't you? Um, I believe you do, yes. So this railway's there, and it's in the bushes. If you, you know, if you go and have a look, you're hard-pressed to find the track. It's like, you know, you, you're going to meet uh, Dr Livingstone coming the other <laughs> way, sort of thing, or, um, you know, David Attenborough's going to crawl out of the grass. Um, um, and there was a company wanted to um, reopen this route to uh, bring some freight up and it would have taken like a huge number of lorry loads off the local roads and the local roads around there if anybody's driven around that sort of uh, west side of Birmingham it's incredibly busy uh, yeah but it's like there's there's it's 
you're fighting your way through roads that were never designed for the traffic that's on them. So this idea is on paper a great idea and then the NIMBYs turn up. The people who have back gardens back in onto it, the local community, and they don't want these freight trains the people, which will run at all hours. And, and that, I think that is the problem. Running at all hours is what they envisage. They've got used to a quieter area. A bit of traffic yeah. during the day and then quiet on a the night. They th honestly think we saw this uh, in the northeast around with uh, getting the railway line running past Shincliffe. Mm. They don't want the noise waking up the kids. That's essentially well, what, what they, they want. What they see is it's being reopened, inconveniencing them somehow, mm -hmm. but not to their personal benefit. Yes. And um, the, the upsum of this is the local NIMBYs, a lot of people with a lot of money, because it's a fairly wealthy area yeah. of Birmingham, so it didn't get reopened. So instead, there's thousands of lorries trundling on these unsuitable roads. And you know, there's some of the excuses like, oh, look, we found great crested newts in the bushes sort of thing. I have to admit, great crested newts, I have uh, put that up as a uh, planning concern myself for certain developments. In some cases, newts are there. The thing is, though, I don't think the newts are going to be too bothered by the trains trundling past, because if, if anything, you see, um, a rail corridor, certainly a lightly used rail corridor for freight, mm. um, you know, you've got the strip of wilderness through a city and there's a lot of wildlife there and it doesn't get disturbed by people in That's the same true, way yes. that it would if it was a path or a cycleway or even a road. Um, so you end up with this oasis of wildlife. And it's interesting actually that in Manchester when they were expanding the Metro Link, again you always get NIMBYs. It's, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you always get the not in my backyard bunch. Yeah. And there were some people who um, tried to take out an injunction against the expansion of the Metrolink in their particular area. I can't remember which bit of Manchester it was. And they tried to argue that it would reduce having what was an old disused railway line turned into a, an operational Metrolink tram system would somehow reduce the value of their houses. And it's like, we want compensation, compensation, money, money, money. Um, but the official report actually discovered that by having the Metrolink and therefore this easy access to rapid transit, um, green um, uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. that um, could whisk you into the centre of Manchester really quickly. So oh, actually the value of your house will go up. And, and all, all, of, a all sudden, of a sudden it all goes away. All, all of a sudden the NIMBYs were like... You're saying my house will be worth £20,000 more? You go ahead, you build that. Can you build two? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was quite interesting. A lot of this is this this fascination with, with house prices. Yes. But yeah, I just thought it was an interesting story whereby, um, you know, the, the argument against it was, oh, it'll make our houses worthless, you have to buy our houses. And then somebody said, actually, no, it'll make your houses worth more. And they're like, oh, oh in that case, yeah, you go ahead. Um, but, you know, it's... <laughs> There's a lot of problems with this in any yeah. big infrastructure project. You know, when they built um, the M40 motorway, um, and that would have been late 80s, early 90s, they had this problem. You, know, any, you mention a motorway and people suddenly freak out. You mention a new runway, people freak out, an airport, um, anything, you know, even an industrial estate. Um, the one that actually I drove past the other day on the A53, there's a big sign saying, coming soon, planning permission granted for a, a gypsy and traveller encampment. And I thought, yeah, there's, there's some, there's some, um, something's, <laughs> something's hitting the fan here. Yes, uh, I think that's a, a debate for a different day. Mm. But uh, it's what I always say regarding houses and uh, travel and community locations. Everyone's got to live somewhere. Yeah. And there's always going to be someone who says, no, they don't have to live here. And I think as well, there's this stereotype people have in their minds about what it's going to be like to, you know, if they're going to build a railway past the bottom of your garden, you know, you've got this, this vision of it being um, trains going past and giving you a toot as you're cleaning your teeth in the bathroom window every time <laughs> they go past. They and then it's going to be dirty and noisy and actually but an electric powered railway is going to be fairly quiet and fairly clean yeah the, the the old chuff 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 of the steam engine that's 
yeah. gone. I'd like that. There'd be a lot of people going, I'd quite like that. Yeah. You, know, you get these people who um, live next to preserved railways, and you know, some people actually quite like that oldie worldy sound. They find it quite reassuring. Yeah. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for coming on. I think we uh, went off the topic of HS2, but I think we covered the main points. Yeah, I think I, we covered a lot of the underlying reasons mm. that kind of give some fleshing out and substance. But yeah. it's always a pleasure to talk about railways. <laughs> That's why I wanted you as my first guest, because HS2 is still a big thing in the news, and I knew that yeah, you'd know yeah. something about it. And uh, where can we find you on the internet? Um, you find me, Jennifer E. Kirk is my YouTube channel, and then maybe a little bit railway related about it. It's one of the things about YouTube. When you find your niche, you get pigeonholed into it. So yes, I, I do have other hobbies and other interests, but <laughs> YouTube, uh, the YouTube audience decided that like, yeah, you know, we like we like model train videos. So that's what my channel now is. But I, I, I am more than that one dimensional person. But you do like trains. <laughs> well, yeah, who doesn't? <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for coming on. So, after Jen said all that, we've had that discussion, here's what's popped up in the news today for another flip-flop. Rishi Sunak has decided to scrap HS2's second phase from Birmingham to Manchester, because Birmingham is as far north as uh, London wants to go, apparently. Oh my goodness. So yeah, all of those plans, all of that time and that money just gone, because apparently it's ridiculous. He will tell delegates in Manchester, the city most adversely affected, that the savings will free up more than £10 billion that can be spent on an east-west high-speed rail link called Northern Powerhouse Rail, as well as improvements to the roads. Oh my goodness. There are so many benefits to HS2. It takes freight off the roads and onto the existing rail line, while passengers go on the other route. That was the idea. That was part of what it's for. It's greener, it's more efficient, and it gets people in and out of uh, places they need to go quicker. But because it's been so controversial because of nimbyism and so many consultants causing problems and always having to have their piece of the pie, don't they? Because we need a major reform to housing and planning. That's another thing. We will talk about that in an, an upcoming episode. Because of all the problems that have been thrown up by people who don't want this thing, now we don't have it. Again, the minority, the vocal, loud minority, win against the majority who would actually just like this to be finished, like it was promised to be. But here we are. That is modern politics. That is why when there's this big development going on, you can guarantee it's going to cost far more than they ever, ever said it would do, take longer than they ever said it would do, and not be as good as they said it would be. Because nothing gets built properly in Britain anymore. We need a fundamental change, and we don't get it because of things like this. Oh, it's become a bit unpopular with people who shout a lot. Therefore, we best stop. We do not get governed in the UK by the best of us. We get governed in the UK by the loudest of us regardless of who's in power. And that's the problem. And if you think U-turns are just part of uh, the Conservatives, think again. How many times have we seen Keir Starmer say something and then go back on it when he talks to someone else? He was all for taking charitable status away from private schools until he wasn't. That's just the latest of his flip-flops. Every single party leader says what they need to say to get a good result at that particular time no one sticks to their word anymore. When was the last time you saw a politician that stuck to their word who was actually in Parliament? I'm not talking about your local councillor here who says he's going to get this pothole fixed and then gets the pothole fixed. I'm talking about the ones that are so powerful that they can actually make a difference to everyone's lives. When was the last time you saw a politician in the UK that did that? I'm genuinely asking because I don't know anymore. The Met Office has issued a very interesting statement, which I'm reading here. September was the hottest on record in England for all of record time back to 1884. Ladies and gentlemen, global warming is real. Global climate change is real. Everyone who is saying, oh, but if you go back a bit further and you go back to X, Y and Z time, it was hotter. So this is natural. I'm sorry, guys. Do you understand that that does not matter? Ladies and gentlemen. I am speaking to you sitting 22 feet from the ground. I am up in the sky, essentially. 
I am talking to you even though I am not in the same room as you. We have people at the moment who live in space floating around the planet. Natural does not matter anymore. It's too damn hot. Turn the bloody temperature down. Let's do it. Natural does not matter anymore. We have the ability to control our environment and you can see from the fact that I'm turning pink already that in October it's still too damn hot so let's turn the temperature down. Can't we all agree that yeah a little bit too hot thanks can we kind of notch it back a bit? I would be very happy if we could do that. Let's all get on board with that. Put all this nonsense argument aside about whether things are bad or whether we made climate change or whether it's natural. I don't care. It's too hot. Turn the temperature down. And now we come to our final section for today, which is about President Trump, former President Trump, and his ongoing court cases in the United States, specifically in New York, where he's talking about this fraud charge that's going on, where apparently he's used a set of uh, figures and all of his finances, he put like a, a few billion into one account and used that to get some loans, then moved it to another account to make that look better to get a series of loans for something else. And essentially he's moving it around. It's the same piece of money, but it looks like he's got more money than he has, which, guess what? You're not allowed to do that. So it's going to trial and it's looking like uh, there's a case to answer here because there is a case to answer here. Whether it's legal or not, that's what the courts will determine. And for the most part, I think he'll find it's not. But here's the thing. I was watching a statement from him last night, uh, and he was saying on the steps of the court that 80% of the claims have been thrown out, which doesn't look quite as good for the prosecutors <laughs> when four out of five of your cases are just thrown out because they're out of time. Here's the thing. Trump didn't make much of that. They weren't thrown out because they weren't valid. They were thrown out because they were out of time. It's over nine years ago, some of these cases, which, yes, there is a statute of limitations in almost every jurisdiction. You can't have uh, a case where, oh, 50 years ago, this person did X, Y and Z, and now we're prosecuting them now. For most crimes, there is a statute of limitations because at the end of the day, you can't prove harm. And it was so long ago that uh, the person clearly wasn't that badly affected. Or if they were badly affected, they should have come forward earlier and uh, we can't get the evidence to support it because it was so long ago. It's things like that. Statutes of limitations for most things. Trump didn't make a big thing of the fact that it wasn't invalid. He's not saying, oh, they threw this stuff out because the crime didn't happen. <laughs> He's saying because it was out of time. There's still one in four of these that would have gone forward. However, I've been looking through every single news site that I can in the UK and no one is talking about four out of five of these claims being thrown out, which is very interesting. We're all seeing in the UK that the case is going ahead. So, here's the thing. If you have four out of five cases just thrown out, that should have been mentioned at least once in one of the reports. So, I'm interested in whether that actually happened or whether he's just talking nonsense because he always overinflates things. He's always saying something that turns out to be untrue. So, you can't take him at his word. If four out of five cases were thrown out, however, that is bad news for the prosecution because that puts them on very slippery slope. And I know slippery slopes keep getting misused in legal terms, but here's the thing. If you're making a case, you want to make the strongest case possible. Any lawyer knows this. You want to make the strongest case you can. So you don't put in things that are going to be immediately dismissed because it puts you on the back foot with the judge or the jury, depending on which it is, Apparently Trump's lawyers forgot to ask for a jury trial. It's a tick box on a form. They would have had a jury trial. Trump is very, very uh, vocal about not getting a jury trial, even though he was uh, entitled to one. It's his joint lawyer's fault. But regardless of whether you have a judge or a jury, if you go into court and say, he did this, he did this, he did this, he did this, and he did this, and these four things that you said he did can't be talked about in that court, this one looks a little less good, doesn't it? Because now you've only got a small amount, and the judge is now thinking, or the jury's now thinking, but four of those things, we can, they've just been thrown out immediately. So, four out of five, not good, not good, not good. 
put you on the back foot. So if this is the case where they've thrown everything at him to see what would stick and most of it hasn't stuck, that is a really bad situation for his uh, prosecutors to be in. You're immediately going into court and essentially taking out a revolver and shooting yourself in the foot as your opening statement. This is a bad situation. It's going to get worse for one side or the other. And we're going to have to watch out which is which. Because on the face of it, Trump is in a bad situation. Because he has clearly done something that's wrong. Some courts have already ruled that he's done wrong. This is a bad situation for him. But for the prosecution to come in and do that... What are they doing? They're essentially going to let him off to a certain extent by minimising the look of what he's done. Oh my goodness. So yeah, this is going to be a bad situation. I want to see how this is going and we will be coming back to this. And hopefully we'll have someone on as part of a conversation where we can uh, talk to them about what the situation is and how it's going down. But for now, that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for joining me for episode one of The Political Ring. It does feel a little bit like uh, this is just starting out and it's not fully polished. I understand that. This is the first of what will be an ongoing series. So I hope you'll watch and enjoy it. And if you have, do leave a comment saying how we can improve or what you did like. And also, if you have any views on any of the topics we've discussed or any topics that you think we should have discussed, do leave them down in the comment section below because I want to have a conversation with you about all of this and we will talk about it more on a segment that uh, we'll have in upcoming episodes where we discuss your comments and have a conversation that way. I want to make this a, a two-way street, so let's do that. But thank you so much for joining me today for the first episode. Until next time, I've been Zoe Kirk-Robinson, you've been watching The Political Ring, take care and have a good day.